<laughs> okay, so now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Wally Rines, who's the chairman and CEO of Mentor Graphics Corporation. It's a big deal to have him here tonight. So give him a big hand. Thank you. It's a pleasure for Mentor Graphics to be able to sponsor or be a sponsor of our presentation tonight by Dr. John Barrow. <clears throat> He's a difficult person to introduce because his resume covers 21 pages. So just to abbreviate, I'd like to highlight the broad extremes of his expertise and interests. He's written 15 books that have been translated into 28 languages, <clears throat> and they cover the extreme range from the book of nothing to theories of everything. Even the department where uh, uh, Dr. Barrow teaches at uh, Cambridge University, where since 1999 he's been a professor of mathematical sciences, the, the department has the name the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. He's written 350 articles, scientific articles, but he's also a playwright. And his play, Infinities, was performed <clears throat> in Italian at La Scala Milan <clears throat> this last year, and it won the, the Italian equivalent of the Oscar and has been uh, seen by 75,000 people. <clears throat> he has a doctorate in astrophysics from Oxford University. He's held teaching positions at Oxford, at the University of California at Berkeley. He's been a professor of astronomy at the University of Sussex for 10 years. He's currently the Gresham Professor of Astronomy, and he was recently elected a Fellow of the Royal Society. He's director of the Millennium Mathematics Project, which is a new initiative to improve understanding and appreciation of mathematics and its applications among young people and the general public. And he's delivered lectures with an extreme range of audiences as well, from the Venice Film Festival to Number 10 Downing Street, from Windsor Castle to the Vatican. And tonight, it's our turn. So speaking on constants of nature, please welcome Dr. John Barrow. <laughs> well, good evening. It's very good to be back here in Portland again, albeit in the rain, uh, as last time. Uh, my task this evening is to tell you something about the possibly arcane-sounding subject of constants of nature. Now, one thing I learned when I was very young is that there are indeed some things that never change. And in my family, those things were called my pocket money. Uh, but I learned later that physicists also know that some things never change. And those things physicists have come to call the constants of nature. They are, in certain respects, just simply numbers. They're for students, those things that you read about in the back of the book, uh, they are listed in uh, great catalogues of quantities describing parts of the world. But what do they really look like? What would some of the so-called constants of nature uh, be described as if you were a physicist or a chemist or an engineer or a mathematician? Well, for the physicist, the true constants of nature are the things that describe the properties of the most basic aspects of our universe. So they might, for example, include in their number the masses of the most elementary particles of matter. This, of course, assumes that we know what they are. Uh, all we can do at any one stage is pick on the most elementary objects that we found or perhaps the most elementary objects that appear in our theory. So these might be particles at present like quarks, which make up the nuclei of the simplest uh, elements. Particles also like the electron, like the neutrino, like the photon, 
uh, things which we believe cannot be cut in half to reveal further internal structure. And then there are other types of quantities which tell you how strong the forces of nature are. We believe that there are, in the low energy world where uh, we walk around, four distinct forces of nature that appear in our world to be different. The forces of gravity, the force behind radioactivity, the force behind nuclear reactions, and the force that manifests itself as electricity and magnetism. And the strengths of those forces, as we'll see, can be represented as pure numbers. And those numbers are very different. The forces are different in character, they're different in strength. And one of the mysteries of our universe is to try to understand why those forces are as they are, why uh, they have the strengths that they do, and why they act upon the populations of things in the universe that they do. As we've learned more about the universe, it's turned out that these different forces are not really distinct. But if you look at the world at higher and higher temperature, we begin to see that these superficially different forces are just different complexions of a smaller number of forces, perhaps ultimately just one single force. So just as ice and steam and water appear in a certain environment to be very different things, different substances, different materials, yet you know when you look in the right way that they are just different states, different phases of the same chemical H2O. Other possible constants of nature are things like the speed with which light moves, something which we believe is a cosmic speed limit. Or there may be quantities which tell us how symmetrical the world is, or perhaps even how slightly asymmetrical it is. What's the balance between matter and antimatter in the universe? What's the difference between the electric charge on a single proton and the electric charge on a single electron? And last in my little list of examples, something that you probably wouldn't have thought of, the number of dimensions of space that exist in our universe. We're familiar with three of them. Is that all the dimensions that there are? Could there be other dimensions? Are there other dimensions? And what are they like? We will come back to that topic nearer the end of the lecture. Well, the whole issue of constants of nature is bound up with the issue of units. Meters per second, feet per second. You remember the... Uh, U.S. space program had a rather embarrassing moment three or four years ago when it crashed uh, a probe into Mars because the manufacturers of the computer program were using uh, feet per second, imperial units. Uh, NASA, like every other human being on the planet, was using metric units. So... Uh, as a result, the probe was not uh, 10 uh, kilometers above the surface, but uh, 10 feet above the surface, and very soon zero feet above the surface. So units are important. Uh, it's expensive if you make mistakes with them. Now, just about 150 years ago, when the Industrial Revolution was at its height in Europe and particularly in the United Kingdom. There was a great proliferation of trade and measurement and the need to define units of all sorts to measure quantities of ale and beer and bushels of potatoes, shipbuilding. So there were units everywhere measuring the stickiness of oil and lubrication. And great committees were set up in British style to try to harmonize these choices of units, to try to reduce them. And some physicists at the time were motivated by this problem to make some remarkable proposals. The first was made by Lord Rayleigh, I think one of the very first winners of the Nobel Prize for Physics, uh, and by James Clerk Maxwell, the greatest uh, physicists probably after Newton. And what they realized was that so many of the units that we were using to measure quantities like time uh, and distance were anthropomorphic. Uh, distance is obvious. Uh, originally, things like the inch were defined to be the size of the, uh, the base of the fingernail of a typical person. Uh, 
The foot, of course, was the size of the king's foot. The largest of these units is the fathom. This was the distance from fingertip to fingertip of a man with his arms outstretched. Uh, about six feet. All these units have one rather obvious problem. Uh, one person tends to be a slightly different size uh, to the next person. So if you're trying to have a universal standard, these type of units based on the size of bits of our bodies uh, are not terribly useful. The next compromise is to try to use something about the motion of the Earth, its rotation or its motion around the Sun. This is something, again, which does slowly change, but it changes very, very slowly. So if you decide to measure time in days or in years, for most practical purposes, you don't have to worry about the fact that the rotation of the Earth is getting very slightly slower and the length of the day is always steadily changing. Well, what Rayleigh and Maxwell pointed out was that one ought to cash in on the fact that there were aspects of nature which didn't change, that there were properties of atoms, there were wavelengths of light emitted by uh, cadmium atoms, for example, or cesium atoms, which were always the same. And if we defined our standards of length and time in terms of the properties of atoms and molecules and their oscillation frequencies and the time that it took them uh, to change significantly, then we would avoid all these difficulties of shifting standards. And eventually that was done, first in about 1904, the first uh, measurements of definitions of length were made in terms of wavelengths of light emitted by cadmium atoms. So the whole idea of using constants of nature became the basis for systems of units. Well, this wasn't good enough still for some scientists, and two rather remarkable scientists had the same idea. The first was an Irishman called George Johnson Stoney, who was the uncle of Alan Turing, the famous uh, computer pioneer. Stoney was a remarkable person with all sorts of unusual ideas. He was the first person to figure out that one could determine whether distant planets had atmospheres or not by working out the escape speed that would be necessary for the molecules of a planet to be dispersed and escape into space. And in that way, we can deduce that the moon has no atmosphere, uh, but the Earth does. Well, what Johnson Stoney and his successor, the famous Max Planck, who uh, was the first to set physicists on the road to the quantum theory, the idea they had in mind was to try and discover if there were units of length and time and mass that were defined only by constants of nature, that didn't in any way rely upon human conventions and human choices of scale. And Planck's choice for this little game was to pick on three constants of nature which he regarded as the most fundamental quantities in our experience of the world. This was in 1899. And what Planck picked was Newton's famous constant, written big G, which is the strength of gravity. The next was his own constant, of course, the quantum constant known now as Planck's constant, which tells us about the quantum quality of the world, the steps in which energy is allowed to change. And the third, now thanks to Einstein, regarded as being fundamental in all sorts of other ways, the speed with which light travels in a vacuum. And it turns out that if you manipulate these quantities, you're going to see some equations perhaps for the only time in this talk, there turns out to be one and only one way in which you can construct a mass, a length, and a time out of those quantities. And these little formula I see happen to be printed on the program that you have in front of you so that you can study them at your leisure. Uh, <laughs> and tell your friends about them uh, at parties and so on. <laughs> so the important thing to recognize about these expressions is that there is just one way in which you can make a length and a time and a mass out of these three constants. 
The combinations are curious. You multiply two together, divide by the cube of the other, and take the square root. So don't worry about that, but look at the sizes. When we convert the answer into our everyday units, it really emphasizes how inappropriate and anthropomorphic those everyday units are. This so-called Planck length is 10 to the minus 33 of a centimeter. It's almost unimaginable. I say almost because I'm going to show you how to imagine it in a moment. Similarly with the time, 10 to the minus 43 of a second. No scientist had ever seen quantities this small before when Planck first wrote them down. The mass is not so bad. It's about 10 to the minus 5 of a gram. About the mass of uh, the wing of a small fly. So this is not quite so extreme. So these quantities are the fundamental ticks of time on which the universe operates, its fundamental yardstick, if you like, of length, and this is the unit of mass that it likes to put in its scales. Well, let's pick on one of these for a moment, just if you like imagining things, this Planck length of 10 to the minus 33 of a centimeter. How can you imagine that? And I'll play a little game with you here, which I'll call the origami of the universe. You've probably heard lectures about the origin of the universe, but this is the origami of the universe. And if you want to win money off people, uh, a little trick that you can play is to take a piece of A4 paper like this and challenge them to fold it in half more than seven times. So they'll never be able to do it. You, you can try it later. It gives you an illustration of the power and the speed with which halving operates. But let's suppose that we could cut this piece of paper in half more than seven times. Suppose we had a rather fancy laser cutter and we could keep cutting this piece of paper in half again and again. Well, if you could do it just 30 times, the paper would be down to the size of a single atom. That's about 10 to the minus eight of a centimeter. If you keep on going, just another 17 halvings, so you cut it in half 47 times, and you're down to the size of the nucleus of the smallest atom, a single proton. Keep on going, a lot more halvings, but not an unimaginable number. Cut this piece of paper in half 114 times, and you're down to that plank length. If you want to go in the other direction, double the piece of paper, double it just 90 times, and you're up to the scale of the entire visible universe, 14 billion light years. So just 205 doublings and halvings of the size of this piece of paper takes you from the smallest scale in physical reality that physicists can talk about up to the largest scale of physical reality. <laughs> Well, knowing that, there was still one thing that physicists had to learn about constants, that it's all very well knowing that there are those fundamental units of length and mass and time. Now it's a good thing to take your other constants and express them in terms of those units. And why you want to do that is because you don't really want to have the things you're calling constants of nature depending on any units at all. You want them to be pure numbers. So it doesn't matter what units, what measuring sticks are being used. And so if you were to take the mass of an electron and divide it by the mass of a proton, that obviously has no units. It's a mass divided by a mass. And it's just a number. And so this is what physicists do in practice. They take the constants of nature of the sort that I've mentioned and they express them in ways that have no units at all. And here are some examples, one rather obvious one, like the one I just mentioned. To take the proton, the mass of a hydrogen nucleus, divide it by the mass of an electron, and you get a number. It's roughly 1836. It's known to many, many decimal places, of course, with great precision. But a mystery of science would be, why is it this number? Why is it not 60? Why is it not 100,000? Why is it not 007? So what is it 
that makes this quantity equal to this very specific number. And you can keep going. Some of the other numbers are not quite so obvious. The number that really defines everything about the atomic world, why atoms are the size they are, why this table is the density that it is, why light behaves in the way that it does, is something that physicists call the fine structure constant. And it depends on the fundamental unit of electric charge, the amount of electric charge carried by one electron, Planck's constant that we've seen, and the velocity of light. And its value is 1 over 137. This magic number 137 that opens the briefcases of every theoretical physicist in the world uh, and probably extracts money from their ATM machines as well if you try it. So 137 is one of the analogous great mysteries of physics. Another one is the strength of gravity. I said earlier that Newton's constant g governs the strength of gravity, but it has units, so it's not really the best way to do it. But if you multiply together the mass of a proton squared and divide by h and by c, we get something that has no units at all. And it's a fantastically small number, 10 to the minus 39. 1 over 10 followed by 38 zeros. And that's a reflection of how weak gravity is. Well, there are many numbers like this, so what's the challenge of them? Well, why do these numbers have the values that they do? This is the greatest challenge to modern physics. Ironically, physicists, experimental physicists, can measure those numbers, can measure the values of these constants with very, very great precision. Probably the most precise experimental work that's done in science is the measurement of the values of constants of nature. And they're the values you find on the back page of your physics textbook. But even though we can measure these numbers with ever greater precision, nobody has ever successfully predicted what the value of any of them will be, and no one has ever explained the values of any of them throughout the whole of the history of physics. So this is a complete closed book so far. So what we want to know is, will perhaps some future great theory of everything, as it's sometimes been called, succeed in explaining those numerical values? And it's those numerical values that really define our universe. They're like the barcodes of physical reality. They're what distinguish our universe from other universes which we could imagine. They might have the same laws as our universe, but they would have different numerical values of those constants. So we don't know yet whether some ultimate conjunction of all the different forces of nature will turn out to predict and explain those magic numbers. We also know don't know how many of them there are ultimately going to be. Will there just be one? Will there be none? Or will there be many of them, just as there are today? And will some of them perhaps be left completely free, almost able to be set at random, rather than programmed uniquely and completely into the way the world is? <clears throat> well, most great physicists have had interesting views about that type of question. Einstein expressed his view in this way, that what interested him was whether God could have made the world in a different way. And what he meant when he was making that statement, he was talking about these constants of nature. He wanted to know whether the world could have been made with the constants taking different numerical values. He believed, perhaps most deeply, that they couldn't be different and that an ultimate theory of the universe wouldn't allow them to be unspecified in any way. They wouldn't be quantities that you just wrote in numerically. But an ultimate theory would completely determine them. There would be really just one way that they could be. Well, when it comes to thinking about constants of nature, you have to worry about what physicists have, and cosmologists have always uh, 
regarded as coincidences. And first of all, we need a little guidance about coincidence from someone who's an expert on that sort of thing. Uh, Miss Marple points out that it's always worth noticing coincidences because if it is just a coincidence, you can always throw it away. But if it isn't, uh, it may be really rather important. Well, coincidences are awkward things. Uh, and when you want to try and explain the values of the constants of nature, it's really very tempting for many people to start juggling around with numbers to see if some combinations perhaps might look like the quantities uh, that you're trying to explain. But coincidences are dangerous because they're really rather common if you look hard enough. So here's one I noticed some while ago. If you take the exponential of pi times the square root of 67 over 3, then to an accuracy of about a part in 300 million, this is equal to the number of feet in a mile. Now this is a pure coincidence. I believe there is no physical significance to that formula at all. But if there does turn out to be, you, hear it, you heard it here first. <laughs> so here's another example of the same sort of thing that somebody sent me, our magic number 137, which physicists would love to explain. Why is it 1 over 137 point whatever? And as you can see, the gentleman had compiled uh, this little list here uh, to try and explain alpha, the fine structure constant, can find all sorts of combinations of mathematical quantities and square roots and exponents and powers and sums and products. Uh, the number 137 is completely ubiquitous, very spooky. So it's just a reflection of how well you can do if you try hard enough. So this is not really what physicists do or are interested in when they think about coincidences. But even so, back in 1937, the great theoretical physicist Paul Dirac, when he was on his honeymoon, no less, uh, noticed some very remarkable coincidences about the constants of nature. And also while he was on his honeymoon, he wrote a little paper and sent it off as a letter to the editor of Nature. Soon afterwards, George Gamow remarked to Niels Bohr, look what happens to people when they get married. <laughs> Dirac, of course, was a very, very unusual person. Uh, and there are many, many Dirac stories. My own PhD supervisor was himself a student of Dirac's. Uh, and Dirac's marriage was somewhat unusual in that Every Sunday afternoon, Dirac had the habit of inviting to his home uh, members of the department for tea if they wished to come. He felt he ought to do that. And people would come every week. And one week they came, and there was a, a relatively young woman uh, handing out cakes uh, that afternoon. And someone uh, said to Dirac, uh, uh, Paul, uh, who is that young woman? Uh, and he said, oh, that's Dirac's, uh, that's uh, Vigna's sister. It was indeed Vigna's sister, but it was also his wife. They'd got married the previous day. <laughs> well, what Dirac noticed was something rather strange. And I'll explain it in words, and I've written some formulae down so that you can look at the numbers. He noticed that if you asked how many atoms are there in the visible universe today, then you can work this out. And it depends on some of the constants we've seen already, uh, the mass of an atom, big G, and the speed of light. And it also depends on the age of the universe, because the universe is expanding. So if you ask how many atoms are encompassed in the visible universe tomorrow, it's a little bit bigger. And the answer to this remarkable little formula is that there's about uh, 10 to the power 78. So one followed by 78 zeros atoms in the visible universe today. So this is an enormous number, a so-called large number of astronomy. He then asked something else. He took two of the quantities on the previous transparency, the fine structure constant, and the strength of gravity, and he divided one by the other. And what that tells you is that if you have an atom uh, 
and you ask what's the ratio of the electric force of attraction between a proton and electron compared with the gravitational force of attraction, you find that the electric force of attraction is 10 to the 39 times stronger than the gravitational attraction. So this is why you don't have to worry about gravity when you do atomic physics. It's totally negligible. So these are two extraordinarily enormous numbers. But I think you can see that there's a curious coincidence in that if you were to square this number, multiply it by itself, 239s are 78. And Dirac thought this cannot be a coincidence. These numbers must actually be related. There must be some hidden formula of physics that we don't know that says roughly that n is equal to n1 squared. So these are the so-called large number coincidences of cosmology. Now this had all sorts of dramatic and unsavory consequences because if you assume that the square of this is equal to this, you see that everything here is a constant of nature which doesn't change. But up here we have the age of the universe which does change. So if you make an equation like this, one of these constants of nature has to re relinquish its status as a constant and change. And the one that uh, Dirac picked on was big G. He didn't want to mess up all the work he'd just been doing on atomic structure. Uh, so he decided it was big G that had to fall with time, like one over the age of the universe. So gravity was getting weaker and weaker and weaker. So this created a great industry. People showed this was impossible because it would have meant that the oceans on Earth would have been boiling in the Cambrian period and there wouldn't be any life now. Much later, uh, a very great American physicist, uh, Robert Dickey, in 1961, pointed out something which was much more profound. That this magic little formula that Dirac thought had to exist was really just the statement that this time, when we are on the scene looking at the universe, is equal to a collection of these constants which is actually the time it takes for a star to settle down and start burning hydrogen and exist in a stable energy producing form. And it's no coincidence that we exist at the time that it takes for stars to form and become stable in the history of the universe. We couldn't exist if the time of our looking at the universe was much, much less than it takes to make stars. And we wouldn't expect to exist millions of stellar lifetimes after all the stars had died. So this coincidence is just a statement of the fact that we live really at the only time when we could expect to be living in the history of the universe. The time when there are stars and they exist in stable form with planets around them. So this famous coincidence is really a consequence. It's just a way of saying that we live at a particular epoch in the history of the universe when stars exist and planetary environments exist. So what this deduction really did for astronomy uh, and for the study of constants was to reveal that the values of the constants of nature and the things that they control are really quite intimately bound up with the things that are necessary in the universe to allow life to exist. And that if you started tinkering with the constants of nature, so if you started imagining like Dirac had that they might be changing or that their values might be different, you have to be very careful. Because if you very slightly change the value of the fine structure constant or that 1836 number, the mass of the proton to the electron, then there won't be any atoms, there won't be any observers. There won't be any astronomers. And so there are certain aspects of our universe which really could not be any different. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here to look at things. So we've begun to appreciate that there are certain ranges of values of the constants of nature which are necessary if there are to be any complex structures in the universe, in particular those complex structures that we call us. Here's a little example. <clears throat> 
So let me pick those two numbers that we've been talking about. Uh, the one that was 1836, I've turned it upside down, so it's 1 divided by 1836. Uh, and along here, this fine structure constant, the 1 over 137. So the value that we have, 1 over 137, 1 over 1836, is just here. So our universe is by the we are here sign. Now let's imagine that there could be worlds where these quantities were different. The physics would be different. The strength of the forces of nature would be different. The masses of these elementary particles would be different. What happens? But what happens is fairly dramatic. If you start making the electron closer and closer to the mass of the proton, you find that you can't have any ordered structures in nature. You can't have any DNA replication. You can't have very finely tuned ordered structures, biochemical structures. If you start wandering into the yellow part of the diagram, then there are no stars. All stars are are very large masses which are large enough so that the pressure of gravity at their center is sufficient to raise the temperature to initiate nuclear reactions which never turn off. If the mass is a bit smaller so the pressure is not so great, you don't get a star, you get a planet. So if you're in the yellow region, you can never initiate those nuclear reactions and there are no stars at all. If you're in this region, there are no simple non-relativistic atoms like carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen at all. If you stray outside this very narrow railway track of parallel lines that run down here, you find out that all the matter that we see would be unstable. So protons, like diamonds, would not be forever. So once you start looking in this way, you see that our world is really remarkably circumscribed in the sense that were it changed in really quite small ways, were the constants of nature changed in small ways, then life in really quite abstract ways, not our life specifically, becomes impossible. So the constants of nature and their values are really rather crucial for making the universe that we see a life-supporting environment. Well, if you're a philosopher or a theologian or even a physicist, then you might ask, why should our universe have constants whose values are life-supporting? Well, like all philosophical questions, this has many possible answers, and it's rather hard to tell which is the correct one. We might just be rather lucky. Maybe the universe could be made in one and only one way. And it's really rather good luck that that way allows life as we know it to exist. Another possibility is that things may be more complicated than we can see and that somehow the constants of nature develop uh, and they converge on particular sets of values, that they evolve in a way. A third possibility is that uh, although the conditions that you need to make life are rather extraordinary, in some sense all possible permutations of those conditions really exist that maybe somewhere in our universe all the possible values of the constants of nature fall out somewhere. Or maybe all possible universes exist in some parallel sense. And therefore there would have to be some universes where the constants fall out right, and not surprisingly we find ourselves sitting in that universe. No more surprising than the coincidence that I happen to be giving a lecture and you happen to be listening to one at this moment. The last possibility is that we may be very blinkered about life, that life may be really almost inevitable, that there may be all sorts of highly abstract, non-chemical ways of making life, and almost any type of universe you care to invent with any values of the constants would sustain complexity of some sort. This is rather unlikely, I think, as we'll see in a moment. 
Well, let's look at just one of these possibilities that's rather topical and interesting at the moment. This idea that uh, somehow all the possibilities actually exist, that there are other universes or somewhere in our universe, perhaps all the possible values of the constants of nature fall out somewhere. And we find ourselves living in one of those places of the universe where things have fallen out right. We've won the lottery, as it were, but it really couldn't be otherwise. Well, in the last 20 years or so, cosmologists have been very keen on a particular scenario for what happened very close to the beginning of the expansion of the universe that we see today. About 13.7 billion years ago, it's argued that the universe's expansion accelerated rather dramatically for quite a short period of time. That acceleration gives the universe all sorts of special and unusual properties. It explains why it expands in precisely the way that it expands today. And also it explains why galaxies exist. And this so-called inflationary universe theory makes a number of very, very specific predictions about what the structure of the universe today should be like. <clears throat> and that's the reason why NASA has spent a lot of money uh, in the last 15 years launching satellite observatories to test those predictions. The most recent test was announced back in February by NASA, the so-called WMAP satellite, which map the little variations in the temperature of the universe all over the sky. This theory predicts very, very specific statistical patterns in the radiation in the universe, and that satellite went out to test whether those predictions are correct. Remarkably, so far, uh, the predictions really are spot on what's seen by the satellite so much so that there will be a further satellite launched in 2007 by the European Space Agency to look even further uh, at smaller and smaller details of these patterns. So this type of theory, I want to stress, is not just a theory, as it were, in the everyday sense of the word. There is strong observational evidence that the whole of our visible universe has emerged from the accelerated expansion of one very tiny quantum statistical fluctuation. However, one can now diverge a little and generalize from this picture. Imagine our universe is the expanded image of one of these tiny little fluctuations, tiny but small enough so that light signals can travel from one side to the other. The rapid expansion ensures that the whole of our visible universe is contained within the expanded image of that little fluctuation. But back near the beginning of the universe, it may be infinite or it's certainly a good deal bigger than just one of those little bubbles. And there will be many, many other little domains and bubbles. All will undergo different amounts of this surging inflation. They will have slightly different fluctuations, slightly different properties. And the properties that get determined by this inflation process can include all sorts of outlandish things, like the values of some of the constants of nature, and even the number of dimensions of space that become large inside the domain. So this theory predicts that if we could see beyond our visible horizon in the universe, we would find that geography is a much more complicated subject than we ever learnt at school. That although our universe looks very smooth and regular from place to place, out to 15 billion light years, which is our horizon, if we could look beyond that, we would find it to be quite different. Even the constants of nature might be different from one region to another as we go to enormous distances. So within our single universe, there could be many permutations and combinations of the values of the constants of nature. Well, as if it's not bad enough to discover that geography was a more complicated subject than you thought, it turns out that history is more complicated also. You remember what uh, Butler said about history and historians, that 
God can't change the past. Only historians can do that. And because they can be so useful to him in that respect, he tolerates their existence. Well, apologies if you're a historian. Well, why does history enter the story? Well, it turns out that that process of little bubbles of the early universe inflating dramatically has a temporal analog. Andre Lindy at Stanford realized, and Alex Vilenkin also, that if this process occurs, then it contains within itself the seeds of its own perpetuation. That if a little region inflates, then it automatically creates within itself conditions for further subregions of itself to inflate, and so on and so forth forever. So this process is self-reproducing. It has no end in theory, and it appears also in theory that it need have no beginning. So we see ourselves as inhabiting one of these fluctuations as part of a process which is eternal to the past and eternal to the future. And each of these inflated bubbles uh, contains different permutations of some of the constants of nature. We don't know which ones or how many can become different, but some will. So again, just within our universe, without being absurdly metaphysical and imagining other universes, whatever that might mean, we can create conditions where, rather naturally, constants and other fundamental quantities can fall out differently. Well, one of those things that can fall out differently, which I've mentioned uh, on a couple of occasions in this lecture, is rather surprising. It's the number of dimensions of space. And one of the great realizations of fundamental physics uh, in the last 10 or 15 years is that space, or our universe, may actually have many more dimensions than the three that we're in the habit of walking around in. It may have perhaps another seven or another eight dimensions of space. Well, what does this mean? How can it be? What's it got to do with constants of nature? Well, the first person to think about such things was the famous German philosopher Immanuel Kant, who before he became a critical philosopher in his uh, early days, was a fairly accomplished astronomer, a mathematician. He developed a theory of the origin of the solar system, uh, and he worked also on the laws of gravity and mechanics, uh, which Newton had developed uh, earlier in the 18th century uh, and the end of the 17th century. And what Kant noticed rather remarkably, he was asking himself how it came about uh, that the law of gravity of Newton was an inverse square law. So the force of gravity falls off as the square of the separation of the centers of the masses which are attracting one another. And it was also known that the strength of interaction between two magnets or between two electric charges also falls off like the inverse square of the distance of their separation. So if you remember your physics at school, you will find these inverse square laws everywhere. And Kant asked himself, why were they squares? So why did the force fall off like 1 over r squared and not 1 over r cubed? And he noticed that the origin of that square is the number of dimensions of space in which the force acts. So you can redo Newton's calculations, follow his train of thinking, and work out what the force of gravity would look like if the world had n dimensions rather than three dimensions. And then all the force laws would fall off like one over the distance to the power n minus one. So if we lived in a four-dimensional world, we would see inverse cube laws everywhere. If we lived in a hundred-dimensional universe, we would see 99th power force laws. So what Kant had shown was that there is a, an intimate connection between the number of dimensions of space of the world and the form of the laws of nature and also the constants of proportionality that sit here, the quantities like big G, their numerical values, which depend on the number of dimensions of space in which they live. 
Well, modern physicists have understood this in much greater detail. And you can draw a rather alarming picture that looks like this. Don't worry about the words. Suppose we live in a world where you could imagine there could be any number of dimensions of space from zero, I stopped at five, but you could keep on going. And you could even change the number of dimensions of time as well. Then we can do the sort of thing that Kant did uh, and that we've learned to do with other aspects of the world. And we discover some remarkable things. That if the world had more than three dimensions of space, there would be no stable structures in it at all. There could be no four-dimensional atoms. There don't exist atoms in more dimensions than three. None of the forces of nature hold things together in when, when the number of dimensions exceeds three. There are no planets, no stars, no gravitational clustering, no molecules, no atoms, no solids. So there is something quite unique about worlds with three-dimensional spaces. If you try to go to two-dimensional worlds or one-dimensional worlds, there are no forces of gravity. There are no complex structures. Again, the world is just too simple to sustain it. If we start thinking about extra dimensions of time, we run into the same problems. No stable structures. If you have more dimensions of time, there are more and more ways for things to decay and become unstable. And if you start venturing into this part of the picture up here, where there are more dimensions of space and of time, something very strange happens. The future is no longer determined by the present and the past. Things become unpredictable. There is no ordering, there is no lawful behavior in the equations of physics. So there is something quite unique about a world with three dimensions of space and one dimension of time. And if all those different little inflating bubbles somehow had random choices of the number of dimensions of space and of time and the constants that go with them, we could only expect to find ourselves in one of the bubbles where there were three dimensions of space and one of time. Well, that's all very nice, but didn't I just tell you just now that Modern string theories, modern attempts to create a theory of everything only seem to work, and they work rather beautifully, mathematically, if the world has seven or eight dimensions of space. So how can this be? Well, the way these predictions are reconciled with the fact that we clearly do walk around in just three dimensions is to imagine that only three of the, of the dimensions are big, and the others are fantastically small. Their size is a size that we've already met in this talk. It's that Planck length, the fundamental length of distance that's defined by the constants of nature. And so the scenario we can imagine is that close to the beginning of the universe, perhaps there were 10 dimensions of space. They were all expanding democratically all on an equal footing. And then there was a parting of the waves. For some reason, three of the dimensions continued to inflate, continued to expand, and they became large. But all the remaining dimensions were trapped, fantastically small in extent, imperceptibly so for us today. And so we just walk around in the three dimensions where there can be stable atoms and structures, Although these other dimensions exist, they don't affect what goes on in our three dimensions. So the great challenge of modern physics is to find ways in which we can perhaps experimentally probe these other dimensions which we suspect exist, trapped on a incredibly small scale. Well, this picture of the world tempts you to think in another way. You see, if there are 10 dimensions to the universe, 11 dimensions, then the true constants of nature exist in 10 dimensions. And the things that we're measuring in the laboratory in our three-dimensional world are, as it were, shadows of the 10-dimensional constants. What we see are not the true constants at all. And there's no reason why they couldn't vary. And indeed, it turns out that if 
there are other dimensions of space and they were to change very slightly or to wobble in some way, we would see evidence of that straight away. Our three-dimensional constants would be seen to change at the same rate that the extra dimensions of space are changing in size. So suddenly a study to see whether our constants are truly constant is of great importance. It's a probe as to whether our universe has other dimensions. So this is a first motivation as to why we might take seriously and study the idea that constants of nature change. There are some other reasons. Some of the constants of nature are not programmed in from the beginning of the universe. The processes like this scenario of inflation suddenly create constants with particular values through a random process of what physicists call symmetry breaking. This is very simple. If I suspend this pointer vertically in the air uh, and let it go, it will always fall in some direction. So although it's perfectly symmetrical in this situation, it's governed by the law of gravity, which doesn't have a preference for any particular direction. When I let go of the pointer, it always falls in some direction. And when it does so, it breaks the symmetry of the law of gravity. So this is a reflection of the fact that the outcomes of the laws of nature are much more complicated, much, much less symmetrical than the laws themselves. And some of the constants of nature arise in this way. A symmetry breaking occurs. So in one part of the universe, there seems to be more matter perhaps than antimatter. Somewhere else, there may be more antimatter than matter. So there are various quantities that arise through this symmetry breaking and then may slowly change subsequently. Some constants may behave in a rather sort of wavy fashion. They may have a, a core value, you know, the first few constants and that they don't change. You better go out and test this experimentally. You may be wrong. Of course, things wouldn't have ended up as candidates for being constants if they weren't really pretty constant to a certain level of precision. And I'm going to tell you about some work that we've been doing in the last four or five years to investigate one of the constants of nature, perhaps the most important of all, this quantity that we called the fine structure constant, the 1 over 137, that depends on the charge of the electron, Planck's constant, and the speed of light, it's a pure number. So is it really constant? Well, if you're a dedicated laboratory physicist, uh, you can go about testing this by monitoring the behavior of atomic clocks, comparing one clock with another, looking in the laboratory at some particular property of an atom, and watching it for a long time, perhaps months, perhaps for several years and seeing whether it's stable with respect to something else. And this is the way in which physicists can place a limit on the rate of change of this so-called constant divided by itself. So this is the, the relative constancy of this constant. And the results are fairly impressive. Uh, the best results at the moment exploit the stability of atomic clocks uh, which are stable to measuring time at an accuracy of one second every 50 million years. So this is really overkill for your wristwatch. But, but what they tell us is if this quantity is changing, then it's changing at a rate of less than 15 times 10 to the minus 16 per year. The universe is 10 to the 10 years old, roughly. So you're sort of saying here that if this constant is changing, it can have changed by less than 21 parts in a million over the whole age of the universe. If you like clocks, incidentally, I was impressed by this accuracy of this clock. Uh, the famous British clockmaker, probably the greatest clockmaker who's ever lived, John Harrison, who was the star of the uh, the film and of the book Longitude by Dana Sobel, Harrison's greatest clock, H4, which he built in 1716, 
for that time, had a staggering accuracy. It was accurate to 39 seconds over 47 days. Uh, and that's an accuracy also that had to be maintained at sea when you're wobbling around in very salty conditions. You make lots of components of the clock out of wood so they don't rust, so they don't contract and expand. Uh, so this gives you a measure of the progress of technology over uh, just a little under 300 years in terms of timekeeping. And again, it's been brought about by exploiting the constants of nature, atomic structure, in measuring time. Well, what we wanted to do was to exploit the fact that the universe is really rather big. And this means that when you look at things in the universe, which are a long, long way away, you are not seeing them as they are now. You're seeing them as they were when the light left the object that appears in your telescope. So if you see an object that's 13 billion light years away, you are seeing it as it was 13 billion years ago. And so what we wanted to do was to make observations of the most distant objects in the universe, which we can see clearly, <coughs> so-called quasars, to investigate the nature of physics, atomic values of their structure, the values of the constants of nature in the environment of the quasar, compare that with the values of the same things here and now, so that we could tell whether the constants of nature 13 billion years ago were different to what they are today. The trick of this technique and the new theoretical technique that we devised to go with observations at new telescopes like Keck on Hawaii, is that the accuracy that we can get through this method is a hundred times better than those laboratory atomic clock techniques. What are we doing? We pick on quasars. Quasars are objects about the size of the solar system that give out a hundred billion times more energy than the solar system. So they're things the size of the solar system that generate as much energy as an entire galaxy. And therefore, they're luminous very, very far away. What they are, in effect, are the dense, bright nuclei of very young galaxies. You can't see the rest of the galaxy, but you can see the nucleus. It's probably powered by a very large black hole, perhaps a billion solar masses in size. It's accreting material. Some of the material goes into the black hole. Others escapes broken to pieces, it produces huge amounts of radiation. And what we're interested in doing is looking at the light from this quasar as it comes towards us through space and reaches our telescopes on Earth. And as it does that, it passes through clouds of gas and dust that are very close to the quasar. And when it does that, the dust cloud will absorb some of the radiation from the quasar, and there will be some telltale barcoding of the intensity of the radiation that reaches us with respect to its wavelength as a result of absorption by those intervening dust clouds. And astronomers in this business spend their time identifying the characteristic absorption lines that show that there are particular elements in these clouds of dust. Maybe carbon, maybe iron, nickel, zinc, lithium, whole spectrum of elements are present and can be identified. We set about measuring the spectra of a very large number of quasars, uh, about 145 so far, and in total looking at 950 spectral lines. And we devised a way of comparing the separation of two spectral lines in every single quasar and comparing that with the same separations of the same emissions in laboratory on Earth. And what you get here is a rather remarkable story, because if you imagine having a catalogue of all the separations of the absorptions from a particular quasar, suppose you imagine you make a little change in the value of the fine structure constant, just a part in a million out at the quasar compared with the value in the laboratory then some of those separations shrink, some get bigger, some don't change at all, 
that there's in effect a forensic fin fingerprint that goes with a small change of the fine structure constant. And it's a very specific fingerprint. So that if there were just sources of noise and turbulence and mistakes in calibrating something, that would just make everything flop around statistically in pretty much the same way. But a real change in the value of the fine structure constant in this environment, compared with what it's like here, carries this very distinctive signature. And so this is how one can get vastly better accuracy than one can ever get just by looking at atoms in the laboratory on Earth. Of course, we need very detailed measurements on Earth to compare the situation at the quasar with the situation on Earth. And here's what we see. So here's how far you're looking backwards in time in billions of years. So 5 billion years in the past, back to 11, nearly 12 billion years in the past. And these points here are collections of 11 quasars. So rather than put 128 points on this picture in a big mess, uh, I'm going to lump them together in groups of 11. And what you see here is this is the shift in the value of this constant of nature between the quasar long ago and us. And if the value was the same at the quasar in the past as it is now, all the points would lie along this dotted line. But what we see here in data from four completely different observing runs taken by different observers, different reduction techniques, is a remarkably consistent story that's really very tantalizing and puzzling. That there's a systematic trend that the fine structure constant was smaller in the past by about 5.7 parts in a million. That's so small it could never be seen in any laboratory experiment. Doesn't change anything that we've been doing in laboratory on Earth. But it's of huge fundamental significance if it's correct. Now at the moment in the world of astronomy and physics there's about one paper being written every day and posted on the electronic archives about this problem. Further observations, theoretical papers, other ways of trying to constrain whether this is possible or not. Attempts to discover whether there could be something that we've not realized going on in the quasar environment that exactly mimics the effect of a change in the fine structure constant. So all of a sudden in fundamental physics there's great interest in whether the constants of nature could really be changing very, very slowly. Well, there's one piece of evidence on Earth that when people think about changing constants of nature, they always have to worry about. And it's a very, very unusual piece of evidence. And it comes out of deepest Africa. In fact, French West Africa, what's now called Gabon, and a region of French Africa called Oklo. Now this is the part of Africa where uranium is mined, uh, and it's mined by the French to power their nuclear reactors and their power stations. And as you probably realize, natural uranium uh, is a mixture of two isotopes, uranium-235 uh, and uranium-238. Now fortunately, when you mine natural uranium, the fraction of it that's in the form of uranium-235 is very, very small. It's less than 1%. That's very fortunate because 235 uh, would spontaneously undergo nuclear reactions uh, and the Earth wouldn't exist if there was, say, 20% uh, of natural uranium in the form of 235. So if you refine uranium uh, for reactors, you want to have about a 20% enrichment of 235. So that's what enrichment means. It means increasing the fraction of 235. Now in 1972, what was happening there was that uranium was being mined out, uh, the abundance of 235 was being very, very meticulously measured back in laboratories at Pierrepont in France. And one very alert technician uh, noticed that 
the samples that were coming back from a particular mine had a very, very tiny uh, depletion of uranium-235. That instead of a percentage of 0.720, 235, there was a percentage 0.717. So in the second decimal place, there was a slight change to what was expected. This is a tiny change for an everyday point of view. What it meant, in effect, for the whole mine was that 200 kilograms of uranium-235 had gone missing from what was expected. Well, at first, there was something of a panic. The French thought this might have been stolen. Uh, terrorists might have got hold of this. There might be some, something untoward going on. But as people investigated further, they discovered something much, much more remarkable. That what had happened in this mine site two billion years ago was that strange coincidences about the geology under the earth had created a natural nuclear reactor. That what had happened was that the sandstone and granite is inclined at about 45 degrees. And within the confined area of rock, there is water and there is uranium. And what happened was that the uranium oxide dissolves in the water. Uh, it would then sink down to the bottom of the slope where it would become very concentrated. Concentrated enough for nuclear reactions to begin, for the reactor to become critical. And after a while, it would all heat up, the water would turn into steam, the conditions would be destroyed, and the reactions would stop. Then it would all cool down again, and later on it would all fall to the bottom, and then it would begin again. So billions of years ago, the reactor ran spontaneously for many, many periods, sometimes just for a few years, sometimes for thousands of years. It's not running today. Eventually, all the fissile material was exhausted, the water disappeared. But a remarkable young Russian physicist, Alex Shalekta, noticed that this whole process hinged upon an extraordinary coincidence of nature. And that is, in order for the neutrons to be captured to initiate the nuclear reactions, there has to be a very, very specific energy level in one of the nuclei involved. And that if you made the tiniest change in the constants of nature, that resonant energy level would not be in place two billion years ago when these reactions took place. So the fact that this natural reactor occurred means that two billion years ago, the fine structure constant must have had the same value inside the Earth to what it had today, to an accuracy of about a part in a million. Well, this is just on the edge of being in conflict with our observations of quasars. But when that happens, you have to do a bit of theory. You need to have a theory for the variation of that fine structure constant. And Jean Maguejo and Harvard Sandvik and I worked very hard a couple of years ago to generalize Einstein's famous theory of general relativity to include the fine structure constant not as a constant but as a variable. And what that means is that if it's a variable and it changes, it can't change in any way. It has to conserve energy, it has to couple and influence other fields. So it turns out that if you allow this quantity to change, it's highly constrained how it can change. And there's just one theory, one way in which it's allowed to do that. And you can find that theory and predict what should happen during the history of the universe. And what's predicted is really rather extraordinary, not what you might think. That although this quantity is allowed to change, for the first 50 or 100,000 years of the universe's history, it actually doesn't change. It stays essentially constant to fantastic precision. And then it starts to increase which is what our observations indicated, very, very slowly in time, just as the logarithm of the time. But it doesn't keep on increasing forever. A few billion years ago, about five to eight billion years ago, we know from our observations of the universe that it started 
to speed up, the expansion of the universe started to accelerate. Observations of supernovae at the edge of the universe have shown us that in the last few billion years, the expansion has dramatically started to accelerate. Previously, it just decelerated. The cause of this is sometimes known as dark energy or the cosmological constant. I'm sure it's something you'll hear about if you haven't heard about in other lectures in this series. However, once this happens, these changes in this constant and in fact any other constant that you want to allow to be a variable all turn off. And Oklo, the natural reactor, its abundances of uranium, live up in this regime here where there would be no constants occurring anymore. So there is no conflict between discerning very slow variations back here in observations of quasars and looking at the natural reactor on the continent of Africa. Well, one other strange thing that you see about this is that suppose our universe hadn't started accelerating. Then what would happen is that the value of this constant of nature would just keep on increasing and increasing forever. And eventually there would be no atoms, no molecules, no structures, no life at all in the universe of any sort. So in some strange way, this mysterious acceleration of the universe has put a break on any change in the constants of nature that might be allowed by the laws of physics. Well, it turns out that there's a critical experiment that we could carry out in the future that would tell us whether we really are living in a universe where that constant of nature is slowly changing. And it has roots in a very famous experiment that you will all, I think, know about. Galileo is supposed, long ago in the 16th century, to have dropped uh, a small stone and a cannonball off the Tower of Pisa. He undoubtedly didn't. Uh, but had he done so, what he would have concluded was that they both fell to Earth with exactly the same acceleration. You remember when the first American astronauts landed on the moon, one of the experiments they did in front of the camera was to drop a feather and a stone and to note that they did both reach the ground at the same time. You see, the moon is essentially a perfect vacuum. If you drop a feather and a stone here, the stone falls faster because of the effect of the air resistance on the feather. But on the surface of the moon and in a perfect vacuum, all masses are expected to fall with the same acceleration under gravity. But if you live in a world where the fine structure constant is not constant, but it varies, this will no longer be true. Materials that contain more charged protons in their nuclei, so heavy materials like iron, will fall at a different rate to light materials like lithium, uh, or water. Uh. The reason is this variation produces a field of force which grabs on to electric charges more strongly in this heavy material than in a light one. So if we could carry out this experiment on Earth or in space, and we believe the quasar observations, we determine how fast alpha is varying, we would expect to find a relative difference in acceleration of different materials of a very, very tiny value, 10 to the minus 13. Now, although that's tiny, it's not out of reach. Our best experiments on Earth tell us that this quantity is less than 10 minus 12. So we need just a factor of 10 increase in sensitivity to reach this prediction. Now, unfortunately, we can't actually do that on Earth. There's a real reason why the sensitivity has only reached 10 minus 12. But in the next five or six years, there are space probes that will be flown to carry out this experiment in space, in a perfect vacuum, in conditions of very, very low temperature. And if they work as planned, they will reach a sensitivity of 10 minus 18. So they will easily reach the required sensitivity and we will have another way of testing whether the fine structure constant is not a constant at all, 
but really a variable. Well, there are many other constants that you can think about looking at the variation thereof. You might wonder if the gravitational force is varying in time. Uh, if it was, you might see all sorts of unusual phenomena, like this one. Uh, that's really another lecture. I hope what I've managed to tell you about today has given you some taste, both of the mystery of the constants of nature, something that really imbues all we do in science, those numerical values determine all the things that we construct and understand about the world. But really we haven't the foggiest idea why they take the values that they take. You can think that the constants of nature are numbers, but really they're not just numbers. They're something that defines the fabric of the universe. If you like, they're the pin numbers that unlock the secrets of the universe. They determine the form of the laws themselves. And one day, perhaps, we might hope to know not only why there are constants of nature and why they take the values that they do, but whether they're truly constant or whether they're changing and whether those changes will go on forever, like you'll be relieved to know this lecture does not. Thank you. I don't know how long I spoke for. Uh, you're about uh, six no. or five minutes. Yeah. Just fine. So, uh, say it, take questions. Get around here and say it. Oh, okay. I thought he was. He doesn't have a Roby microphone. He's actually someone who's going to ask a question. I see. Well, do you want to sort of you act as okay. chair and pick on people and bring it to an end? Okay, we got uh, do a little Q and A now for those of you guys who want to hang around. You want to go ahead over here? Well, a simple way to think about dimensions is the number of pieces of information that you need in order to be sure to meet your friend when you sort of make a date to meet them. So you need to pick the two cross streets and if you're meeting them on a particular floor of the building you need then to give a third piece of information and that will guarantee that you will meet them at the unique place specified in three dimensions. And so you could think in the same way that if you want to define a point uniquely in five dimensions you need five pieces of information to do that. We're familiar with going from two dimensions to three dimensions. If you move something that's two-dimensional, like the sheet, it sweeps out three dimensions. If you move something that's three-dimensional, in a sense, it sweeps out four dimensions. So I think imagining many other dimensions of space is not too difficult. I think it's imagining more dimensions of time that's really very challenging very hard to imagine what it would mean to have two dimensions of time. You could perhaps think of ourselves moving along one river, one line of time, and there's another one sort of going parallel to us, flowing at a different rate, and that we could somehow step into the other flow and step back to the other flow. But that's a much more challenging thing to imagine. Thank you. There's one over here. Thing. Yeah, I have a question about uh, once you sort of assume that these so-called constants are not constant and start with that as your premise and start looking for change, it seems you sort of enter a <clears throat> potentially confusing state because in order to say there's a change in this alpha constant, you're sort of, are you not assuming while you measure it that these other things at least are holding constant? <coughs> So that I know this one is the one that's changing. It seems like if if time or something else were were changing, 
then your measures would be thrown off. And I'm wondering if I'm making any sense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, as in all scientific investigations, it's best to just change one variable at a time. So uh, it could be that many constants are, in fact, changing. Uh, it would be rather odd if they were all changing at different rates, which just happened to make them all observable and enter at the same level. So what one is trying to do is pick on situations in astronomy where there, is a ver there are a very small number of constants involved. So in the case of the spectra, it's just the fine structure constant. Uh, and you're testing one hypothesis uh, initially that this constant is the same there uh, and then as it is here and now. Uh, and you can then think about uh, opening the game up. So other people have investigated situations where it might be that ratio of the electron to the proton mass that's varying. Uh, you can also get at the variation in the gravitation constant in ways that don't affect the other constants. So part of the skill in the business is picking situations where there is not a big collision uh, of effects uh, and trying to investigate them one at a time or maybe two at a time. Okay, is there someone upstairs there? I'm... Yeah. Uh, your diagram showing the parallel tracks which showed the limitations on whether or not this universe doesn't exist if you move beyond certain ranges. It seems that also implies that there's a finite domain in the center of it in which things could exist. And in that domain would be an infinite number of combinations of numbers. What keeps the constants or variables, as we might call them now, from varying willy-nilly among that range? Well, they may do. We don't know. I mean, obviously, as time has gone on, just if we picked any constant, you know, one epoch, we've measured it to six decimal places. A few years later, we measure it to a few more decimal places. So our knowledge of that constant has changed. And uh, as far as we know, that there is always some finite region in that diagram where we can uh, shift the values without destroying everything. Uh, and the variation of the fine structure constant is really showing that, that you can change at a level of a few parts in a million. Uh, what you might be asking, really, is then, could it be that the deep theory that we've not found, you know, the theory of everything, doesn't allow that type of little shift at all? I was looking today when I was sort of being driven from the University of uh, West uh, Oregon, uh, that there are these great, what we call in England, electricity pylons or towers uh, with overhead power lines. And if you look at those towers, you'll find that one of the design principles of them is a, uh, they're made of triangle shapes. And to give them strength, you sometimes find that there are further triangles within triangles. So they have this type of uh, uh, nested triangular structure. Uh, they don't do that just to look pretty. So if you're an engineer, you'll know why that's done. The triangles are rigid. So if you have a triangle and you try to distort it, you can't do it. So these structures are strong. That they can't be distorted and changed into another shape that's just really close by. Whereas if you have a square, it is not a rigid structure in the same way. So if you have a lattice which is squares, you know you can change it very slightly. You can turn it into a little parallelogram that's nearby. So you can slide it along. And what we're really wanting to know is, is nature in respect of its constants like the triangle? Is it rigid so that you can't shift the structure into another nearby structure where the constants are slightly different? Or is it like the parallelogram and the square? that you can slightly distort it smoothly into something that's as close as you like. And it's still coherent and it still holds together. And we don't know the answer to that question. So many people suspected long ago that if you ever found a theory of everything, it would specify the constants of nature uniquely and completely. And there would be no freedom at all. They would have to be what they are. But as people have explored string theory and M-theory, uh, 
It really doesn't seem to be like that at all. There are some constants which will be programmed in like that, but there are a huge number of other constants of nature, so-called, which are not specified by the string theory at all. They are free to fall out in all sorts of random different ways, however they wish. So the universe appears to be much more like the flexi uh, square rather than like the rigid triangle. Let me read one <coughs> here, Lisa. Uh, what are the effects of black holes, white dwarfs on the constants of nature? Time dimension, are the constants constant because of their uniqueness? Okay. Well, just black holes and white dwarfs. What happens when things disappear in black holes? Well, uh, black holes are determined in many ways by the values of the constants of nature. The gravitation constant determines the size of a black hole that has a particular mass. Uh, if Hawking is correct, as most physicists believe, that black holes are not entirely black and they evaporate particles very slowly like black bodies thermodynamically, then that thermodynamic process is determined by other constants of nature in a very remarkable way. But something to remember about black holes is that they're really not as strange as the movies tell you. Very large black holes are very benign. A black hole that's a billion times as massive as our sun, and such black holes seem to be at the centers of many galaxies, including our own, has a density less than that of air. And if we were all at this moment falling through the horizon of a one billion solar mass black hole, we wouldn't notice anything strange at all. You would feel no strong forces, nothing unusual would happen at all. It's only when black holes become very, very small. A black hole as massive as our sun would be about the size of the center of Portland. But if you tried to fall towards that black hole, you would be torn to pieces. You would be stretched and squeezed, and all your atoms would be dismembered. So, uh, in a case of a big black hole, if something falls into a black hole, nothing odd happens to it. It has all the same properties that it would have on the outside. But the only thing that's different is if you're standing on the outside, and you're watching that object, after it falls into the black hole, there's only three things you can know about it. The mass of the black hole, the electric charge, and the spin. Nothing else about things inside the black hole is available to you. Whether they're painted red, whether they're painted green, whether they're made of brass, whether they're made of iron, whether they're electrons, or whatever, you don't have that information. Whether it's matter, whether it's antimatter, that information does not get out of the black hole. It's not that the things that have fallen in have ceased to have any of those properties. If you're falling in with them, they're still made out of matter or antimatter. Things are still green or blue. They're still made of iron or brass. But just that information doesn't get out of the black hole. So there is nothing specially peculiar about black holes with respect to the constants of nature. They're described by them. They may offer us good ways to determine the constants of nature in the future. Uh, they may not. Okay, good. I'm going to read you one other one here, which is a, uh, it's sort of like, what is a nice guy like you doing in a place like this? But it's, uh, how did you get into this? And uh, in, what got you into this field, this job? And how much of your time do you spend doing what you're doing, like, tonight in research? And Well... My position in Cambridge is, is uh, quite a nice one. I spend half my time uh, directing an a education program in mathematics and all its applications, both in physics, finance, engineering, pure mathematics, economics. Uh, and that program is for school teachers. It's for students from age 5 up to 18. It's also for members of the general public. And it's a program called the Millennium Mathematics Project. So you can look at all our websites. Everything is completely free uh, and very interactive. We do lots of video conferencing nationally and internationally. Uh, so I do a lot of that activity, managing that project with specialists in education in different age groups, uh, technical specialists and creating websites and materials. 
and also giving uh, talks and lectures about uh, unusual topics that link with mathematics. So, for example, recently I gave a series of talks about mathematics and sport uh, and how mathematics can enable you to understand rather unusual things about what's going on in sport, uh, why people use the Fosbury flop, for example, as a high jump. Uh, where on earth should you try to break the world weightlifting records, knowing what you do as a physicist? Some places are better than others. Uh, who really is the fastest runner in the world when you take into account air resistance and things like that? So I spend roughly half my time doing that. The other half of my time I spend doing research into cosmology, some of the subjects I've talked to you about. I have many research students and collaborators both in Cambridge uh, and collaborators in other parts of the world. Uh, strangely, in physics, uh, people outside of physics find this very strange. I have some collaborators I've never met and never even spoken to. So we've mm. written several research papers together over a long period of time, but we've never met uh, mm. and, and never even spoken on the phone. But most of the people I collaborate with, I certainly have met. Uh, so I hope that gives you some background. Okay. Yeah. Let's do one more round because we're kind of a little bit late, but let's one here, one there, and one above. So here. Uh, why do the constants, uh, if they vary at all, vary so slowly compared to Planck time? Right? We're talking uh, one part or 10 to the 65th or something like that. If, if, are there any clues as where the Well, we know, of course, that there's a sort of selection effect. If they were changing very rapidly, we wouldn't be here to see it. Uh, we see... What's interesting is to compare the rate of change with the rate at which the universe is expanding. So we're seeing, if we believe we're seeing variations in the fine structure constant, they're occurring about a million times slower than the universe is expanding. Now numbers like a million we come across in other places, if you look at the level of fluctuation in the universe, uh, the irregularity in the universe everywhere, it's quite similar to, it's about 1 over uh, 200,000. So of order a millionth to 100,000. So there certainly are numbers of this order. But we're not able to predict that number. Okay? So we can attempt to build a theory that has one free parameter in it, which tells us the rate at which a constant changes. This is not surprising because we're not able to predict what the values of these constants are. So we shouldn't really expect to be able to predict their rate of variation. So all we can hope to do with theories is perhaps have a theory that links the rate of variation of one constant with the variation of another. Okay, how about over here? Um, if the mm. constants of nature were to change, would that affect the possibility of time travel? Not particularly. I mean, time travel is a possibility in theory, in Einstein's theory of general relativity, uh, and he doesn't really care what the constants of nature are. Well, it's only the gravitation constant that plays a role. Of course, if you wanted to build a spaceship or send atoms or something on the time travel trip, uh, changes in constants would affect that. But uh, time travel is something that is possible in principle, but the trouble is knowing whether it's actually possible in practice. You see, there are lots of things which physics allows to occur, but which will never be seen. Uh, a nice example I like to give is, is levitation. You see, the laws of physics don't forbid this projector suddenly moving up in the air. You see... All it would require is for all the molecules inside the projector and underneath the table, which are all moving randomly and chaotically, all to suddenly be moving in the same direction upwards at the same moment. Now that could happen, and there would be no violation of the laws of nature if it did. But the probability of it happening is so infinitesimally small that in the whole age of the universe, not once would such a coordinated motion of that huge number of molecules ever occur. And one suspects that time travel is a little like this, that it's possible in principle, but it requires such an extraordinary fine-tuning 
and coordination of conditions, that it never arises naturally, and it requires too peculiar engineering, too extreme engineering, for it ever to sort of be artificially created. Okay. So, but it remains a possibility. And what's odd about it is that it's a possibility predicted by Einstein's theory of gravitation, and it's not, therefore, in conflict with any of the other known laws of nature. All this crazy nonsense that you see in the movies about going back into the past, changing the past, this is nonsense. Okay, it's logical impossibility, just a story. The past is what it was. There are not two pasts. So you can be part of the past, but you cannot change the past. So time travel means that there are circular histories, but they are logically consistent histories. I like to give one little example of a logically consistent history. Suppose that uh, uh, I had seen too many Hollywood movies and I thought I would go into the past and shoot myself when I was a little baby in my mother's arms to produce a factual contradiction with my own existence today. And I go back into the past carrying my shotgun and I see my mother in the past holding myself as a little baby. And so I pick up my gun and I take aim to shoot myself and just as I go to pull the trigger I feel a spasm in my shoulder from an old injury and it causes me to jump. My shot goes astray, but the noise from the shot frightens my mother, who drops the baby, who injures his shoulder. <laughs> so that's a self-consistent history. That's good. Okay. Is somebody up there? Above? Yeah. Uh, Einstein had a cosmological constant that later in his life thought was a mistake. It's my understanding that scientists feel that that cosmological constant was actually correct. Can you help me understand why he thought it was a mistake and why it's now considered correct? Yeah. Um, in sort of simple language, what Einstein did was to uh, show that his general theory of relativity uh, allows the law of gravitation that we all know and love uh, Newton's law of gravitation, which says that if you have two masses, then the force between them is an attractive force that varies like the inverse square of a separation of the masses. But Einstein found out that his theory allows another part of this law to exist, that there can be another constant that he called lambda. And this is the so-called cosmological constant and this other part of this force is very strange. It's repulsive, so it has a plus, and it increases with the separation of things. And so you can see that when separations are very small, this term wins out, and we have ordinary gravity. When separations get very big, this should win out. So if you were thinking of an expanding universe, Einstein liked this term because he thought that you could make this cancel out, set this equal to zero, so there'd be no force of gravity in the universe and it wouldn't need to expand. So if you have a universe governed by this law, it, its size against its time, it starts to expand like this and then it switches over and starts to accelerate when this term takes over. Now we know that from our observations of the universe a few years ago, uh, that mysteriously the universe is accelerating today. These observations were only possible with the Hubble Space Telescope. And so that's why you've only sort of heard this news a few years ago. You can see for the first time exploding stars, supernovae near the edge of the universe. You monitor a piece of sky, come back a few days later, you monitor it again, you can look at thousands of stars in that field and some of them will have brightened and exploded. So in our universe, roughly one star is exploding every day. So you catch many of these supernovae as they're exploding, watch them with the Hubble Space Telescope for a few weeks, you discover that the light varies in a very special way that happens to be exactly like it varies in the supernovae nearby. 
So you believe those supernovae far away are intrinsically the same sorts of thing as the ones we're seeing locally. So you can use their variation to figure out how far away they are and the redshift, how fast they're moving. So we now believe that the universe is indeed accelerating. Einstein didn't like this idea after people pointed out that it couldn't stop the universe uh, expanding. If you tried to do that and you just perturbed the universe very slightly, it would start expanding. So Einstein said this was his biggest blunder. Uh, he didn't believe this term existed and there was no evidence for it, uh, and so he gave it up. But it's re-emerged. It's pretty much exactly what describes this acceleration that we see today. The great mystery about it all is where does this term come from? What is it? And in particular, what is its value? Because if we measure this as a pure dimensionless number in units of our Planck mass to the minus 2, what's its value? It's 10 to the minus 121 smallest number that we've ever seen in physics. If it was just 10 times bigger, 10 to the minus 120, we would not exist because the universe would have started to accelerate a little bit earlier before there could be any stars and galaxies forming. So once the universe starts accelerating, no stars and galaxies can form anymore. So if this fantastically small number was just 10 times bigger, there wouldn't exist any stars, any galaxies, and any astronomers. So the biggest mystery in physics at the moment is this number. Everybody was expecting it would be zero in the way that Einstein did, and it was a great shock to particle physicists when astronomers said it's not zero, it has this very, very small finite value. What's the origin of this quantity? People think it's a sort of vacuum energy in the universe, a sort of zero-point energy. You know, the base ground floor level of energy in the universe, the minimum that it can have. But we don't know whether it could be different, whether it has to have this value, uh, and what's the explanation for it. So this is the big challenging problem of modern astronomy. I believe these observations which will be done very, very carefully by several completely independent groups, are correct, and that the universe is indeed accelerating today. And, in fact, we have other evidence from other observations, nothing to do with the supernovae, uh, that also indicate that it's accelerating. So I think there's no real doubt about that, but there's just a huge mystery as to why the ground state energy of the universe has this tiny non-zero value. And we could regard this as another constant of nature, a so-called cosmological constant. So that's the uh, homework assignment. Uh, somebody out here in the audience in their lifetime is going to maybe give us some insight into that, hopefully. Yeah. So uh, be sure and turn these in. Thank you, Dr. Barrow.